Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News Network. We're continuing our interview with Robert Shear, who joins us again in the studio. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And one, so, more, uh, one more time, Bob Shear is a veteran U.S. journalist, currently editor-in-chief of the five-time Webby Award-winning online magazine, Truth Dig, and Bob's whole biography you'll find below the, the video player here. Uh, well, you let can me defend, let, I, I, in our first segment together, we wandered quite a bit from my mother arriving from we Russia. We haven't done much on your father yet, yeah, so we have got to pick that well, up. Yeah, a great guy, and from my mother arriving from Russia, and then, you know, we ended up uh, at Palantir and Silicon Valley and the military industrial complex. I guess that's kind of a long-winded answer to your question of where do I get my inspiration or my ideas? You know, I'm still at work. More than that. Your whole career is taking on very challenging, controversial, sticking your neck out topics. So it's all about also But also that. complex topics. I like figuring stuff out. Uh, I, I, I find it inter intellectually stimulating. Uh, I'm not bored. And so the example I used in our last interview, I just, that, the morning of our interview, I'm reading, you know, the news at four in the morning because I can't sleep. and. You know, and the whole court, the Secretary of Defense is in Silicon Valley, gave a speech at Stanford, and I said, oh, wow, that triggered thoughts about my own book and things I may have missed or things I would add to the next edition. And particularly in our last discussion, I was, we were talking about a speech he gave, the Sid Drell Lecture at Stanford, uh, and he was boasting about the close connection between the Pentagon and the intelligence agencies and Silicon Valley companies. And he offered the example of InQtel, a company uh, that was founded with CIA support. And the CIA was InQtel, uh, was Palantir, one of the companies spun off by InQtel, was their client, their only client. For yeah, the so you've got this years. problem of Silicon Valley is making tremendous amounts of money cooperating with the government and all this. And you've got this kind of libertarian thread, we're told, within their ideology and outlook. Well, so that we're self-made people and all we do. And there's a contradiction, by the way. Uh, that's what my book is all about, this contradiction. Uh, that First of all, uh, let me let me. Let see. me just remind everybody, this is the book <laughs> Robert's talking about, is they know everything about you, how data collecting corporations and snooping government agencies are destroying democracy. Yeah, and let me apologize. I'm usually the interviewer. Uh, so uh, maybe I'm, I'm playing that role also, interviewing myself. But, uh, you know, uh, first of all, let me say, I'm really not that interested in my own history. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very interested in where we are now. You know, yes, I've done a lot of real, you know, I think interesting, important, blah, 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 blah. But I get kind of bored thinking about it. And, you know, I'm now 79 years old, and maybe I should be, you know, sitting on some, you know, retirement funny farm thinking about the Thinking about the old days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they weren't, you know, I, I, I think these days are more exciting. Uh, and let me explain, by the way, I, I love the Internet. I love the new technology. I'm not a Luddite. I have to say that. I run an Internet publication. I've done it for over nine years now, and we've won a lot of awards. I love the technology. I'm an early adopter to everything. Uh, for one thing, when growing up, uh, they didn't use the language of learning disabilities or differences or dyslexia or anything, but I had a pretty pronounced case, and I had a hard time with cursive. I had a hard time with spelling. I, you know, and as a result, I ended up studying engineering because I really had a hard time writing essays and so forth. And I have a, a son, my son Josh, who has been the major researcher on my books, uh, and invaluable to me, and you know, really smart. But he has had an even more severe learning difference. Uh, and was even a student at USC where I teach. When I was there, he did better than his brother who didn't have any <laughs> like this. Uh, but, uh, so I, I've dealt with those uh, kind of issues of how do we learn, yes. You were starting to dig into the contradictions in Silicon Valley and libertarian. No, I explain you know. why I'm an early adapter on, on the internet and it relates to Silicon Valley. I'm a big fan. I, I interviewed Bill Gates for Talk Magazine and we both talked. I said, my only criticism of Microsoft is you didn't have spell check on your first programs. And you know how I had to go out and buy an IBM display writer that cost me 35 grand my entire book advance uh, 
in order to have spell check and all this stuff. And he laughed and he brought, and brought in the guy who wrote his spell check program. So I am not against the technology. For someone with my learning issues, and I've talked to the founder of Kinko's, I've talked to plenty of people with learning issues who are successful, and we all agree this technology has been incredibly liberating. So I only could become a writer because of computers. Yeah, same with me, I can't spell. Well, it's not just the spelling, it's the ability to move, chat, organize, you know, sure. my mind goes off, as you can tell, in a lot of different directions. And, and you know, so uh, it's been a great boon. And having the internet, so you don't have to have a major library and live in New York or Washington, you could be in Podunk and still read original documents yeah. and do your own search. The internet is incredibly liberating and I never go anywhere without some kind of little machine. Okay, so that's the positive. The downside is most people don't ever go anywhere without the little machine. And the little machine, even when you think is off, can be controlled by the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, and be spying on your entire family and intruding on your home in violation of the Fourth Amendment without a warrant and can see where you ate and who you ate with and correlate it with other data. And because of cheap storage space and massive, powerful computers can do by biometric right. comparisons, and so we have no privacy, yeah. and we can discuss that because that's what my book is about without privacy. Well, isn't part of the problem here and it, is that libertarian philosophy yeah. embraces as one of its core principles the right to private ownership the, and the uh, virtue of for-profit enterprise, and when that gets into the area of data and working with the government, the for-profit character of the enterprise trumps the libertarian ideology. That's only if you're a sellout libertarian. If you're a, if you're a sincere libertarian, of which we have many people, you believe in a free market. Not a. You don't believe in crony capitalism. You don't believe in big uh, uh, market dominating cartels or monopolies. Uh, you until, have, until perhaps you own one. Well, that's. Uh, I'm not here to defend. No, but I'm asking, is there any, is there any I, I, libertarian I, 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 in Silicon Valley that actually yes, puts I those see, principles it ahead of... Mean, it depends what you mean by Silicon Valley, but I can tell you, when you go to Stanford, you will find good lawyers and good consumer advocates. Uh, Alicia McDonald is one of them. I could give you names. But there are plenty of people pushing back, even within Google, within Apple, uh, who believe in a truly free market. So, you, you know, you don't have something like Facebook. See, Peter Thiel is not one of them. Peter Thiel actually has written about the need to dominate a market. That's the opposite of what Adam Smith was talking about. The, the model of capitalism that libertarians are supposed to defend is one in which you don't have a manipulation of the market. And so, Which is completely utopian, never existed. To, it's like some idea of some okay, notion that, of the past that never happened. To, you know, one could attack notions of the left in the same way. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So that's not as interesting as figuring out what is healthy and good in any of these ideas. So on the left, what is healthy and good is an idea of an equal playing field, at least, of equal opportunity, of public education, uh, of helping people when they're down so they can get up again, of some social responsibility. That's why I'm on the left. I'm not a right-wing libertarian. Uh, you know, if uh, I would previously I said I'm a bleeding heart liberal, only liberals have sold out so much. I worry about that label. Uh, but, but, you know, yet people could attack people on the left and say, wait a minute, it gives rise to totalitarianism. Look at those governments around the world that claim to be socialists. They're horrible. They, they just There's jail people. They torture them, blah, blah. So I'm more interested in seeing are there any good ideas? And I think the libertarian idea is a good, there's a, something very valuable there. When, and when you talk to Matt Welsh, who's the editor of Reason Magazine. or well, We often do. Yeah. Uh, well, then I think these are principled people. I, th I thought Ron Paul, <laughs> I don't agree with Ron Paul on everything, but I had kind things to say because I thought he was consistent. His criticism of the bailout, he voted against the reversal of Glass-Steagall. He, he, he cared about privacy. He Ron Paul's been very consistent. Yeah, okay. So what is valuable about that idea, and it relates to my book, 
is an idea that the framers of our Constitution had, you know. And because they were dealing with, with uh, a, a, an economy that basically gave the individual who was white and male, quite, and we'll put that already so we don't have to get a lot of letters about that. It was a flawed society and it was racist and had slavery and so forth. And Howard Zinn is, was absolutely right and a necessary corrective to anybody who wants to understand the American experiment. So, and it wasn't just him. We had the Charles and Mary Beard, great historians who stressed the economic inequality and so forth. So there are plenty of people down through the years have showed, okay, but there was something brilliant, wonderful, liberating about our Constitution. And, and that is also embraced by many libertarians. And that's the notion of limited government, the, the notion of individual sovereignty, that the individual right, has to basically be in charge of their feelings, their thoughts, their education, one's thoughts, one's education, and that we individuals also need each other and we want to live in societies. And so for all of the things that John Stuart Mills and Rousseau and, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, everyone else has written about, uh, Bertrand Russell and others, we then cede power to the state, you know, in the post-Enlightenment uh, idea of the state that was codified more clearly in the American Constitution than any document in human history. And so the American Constitution is a great gift to human understanding. It's a great guide. And, and the heart of it and I think the assumption of the American Constitution, which is why we're running into trouble with people, you know, uh, Citizens United and our corporations' money, I don't think they anticipated monopolistic corporations in the new colonies because that's what they were opposing from England because they assumed they were government-sponsored or government-authorized, right? So if we could keep government out of it, I, I, I think they had much more of a rural model of stiff-necked independent farmers and feed buying their feed and making decisions and being politically involved and understanding their environment and understanding their needs and keeping things local right the whole idea was very great suspicion of anything national and avoid foreign entanglements don't have big empire and so you would have a, a universe that you could comprehend as a farmer or as a, a, a urban worker you know, uh, craftsman or artisan, and uh, you could comprehend the political questions. Should we widen the highway? Should we bring the water in here? Uh, you know, all those decisions. And we have to keep government li limited because power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolute. We don't want kings, we don't want things. And this was a great idea, and it presupposed, the reason I bring up Adam Smith, it, it presupposed a relatively free market where an invisible hand, meaning no one company could determine you know, the price. They didn't understand the free market inevitably gives rise to monopoly. I understand that well, any more than the socialists of their day understood that uh, socialist movements inevitably give rise to a certain totalitarian manifestation. So far. So far. Okay. Well, I wouldn't actually say so far. I That's not even true because right. I think in Latin America okay. you're seeing some variations. Right. Of so my feeling, and this started at a very early age. I can tell you why, uh, but it actually started during the McCarthy period when I was delivering milk in the Bronx and I was a young kid, and people were who, in this project that I lived next to, where there were people. It was built by the Fur Workers Union, and so there were quite a few of these sort of lefty worker types there, and people were throwing out their libraries. You know, they were scared. And uh, one day I found the collected works of Jefferson. They were big green books. Somebody had put a ribbon around it, and there were like 20 of them, and it was by the garbage can. And I brought them home. And someone else was also brought out the collected works of, of Stalin, and I think there was even Trotsky. And anyway, I would collect these books, and I actually took them with me when I went to graduate school to Berkeley and everything. It was my first library with thrown out books. Okay, and I, I remember being a big Jefferson fan quite early. And yes, there are many aspects of Jefferson's life that are reprehensible. Uh, we know that, uh, and Washington's as well. But there was a wisdom to these folks because they saw what empire did to England. After all, they once believed in England, 
even with the monarchy. And they saw what it did to the English notion of law. They saw how it betrayed the Magna Carta. They, so they came up with two really big ideas. You can't have a republic and, and an empire in the same moment. That's what destroyed uh, Greece. It destroyed uh, Rome. It destroyed any apprehension uh, 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 that you... Uh, uh, had uh, not apprehension, but any expectation uh, that you had that the, a limited monarchy could be reasonable, and all, uh, generally that the desire to have empire and extend your reach meant that truth was a casualty, as it is always of war. It meant that you would not know what's going on. It was the opposite model to the one we had of agrarian democracy, where the farmer knew what he needed to know politically, and you didn't get this dumb question of, I don't know what's going on because it's all classified and who knows if they have weapons of mass destruction in Iraq or not, but I want to, you know, kill those ragheads before they kill me, you know, and you get into stupidity, racism, madness, and in the case of Germany, you get uh, fascism, Italy, fascism. So, you know, that was one big idea they had of limited government is you can, if you're going to be a representative republic, you can't be an empire. That's why that, that constant theme of avoid foreign entanglements, don't get involved. You know, if you read Washington's farewell address, it's unbelievably clear. Uh, use gentle means, force nothing, beware the impostures of pretended patriotism. George Washington's farewell address that he wrote in collaboration with Hamilton and Madison, that he worked on for, for as we know, for over five years because he thought he, he was going to be a one-term president. So George Washington's distilled wisdom in co collaboration with the key minds of our revolution was beware the impostures of pretended patriotism. This is from a general, very similar to the warning from general turn president Dwight D. Eisenhower about the military and this government. In the councils of government, we must gar guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Because war makes you crazy. Uh, conquest makes you crazy. It, it destroys what's decent about the human experience. Big theme. And the other big theme is the sanctity of the individual. That When you travel in totalitarian countries, I don't care whether you're left or right, it's unavoidable, it slaps you in the face. I, I can tell you, I interviewed Fidel Castro uh, the night that the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia, I was in Cuba. I inter I've interviewed, you know, uh, leaders in totalitarian societies all over the world. I've been there, I've written about many of them, and, and the thing that happens is if you lose sight that the individual is king, you go down that slippery so yeah. We're going to keep these sort of in 20 minute segments or so, and we're going to leave everybody hanging for the next segment. So please join us for the continuation of Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.